Can we please pray? Dear Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you very much for this beautiful day. Uh, we thank you for all the ways in which you uh, graciously take care of us and provide for our needs. Um, be with us as we study your word tonight uh, to learn more about you, more about what you've done in history and what you continue to do. And uh, please be with the people of this world. Uh, we know that there's a lot of people who are struggling and challenged by many, many different things. Uh, share them of your presence and use us to help them in whatever way is possible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking about the Hebrew Scriptures. Most of the time we talk about the Old Testament. But I think in terms of referring to it as the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, it kind of emphasizes the fact that uh, different part of the world, different culture, different language, different ways of looking at life, different beliefs. Uh, so many times we kind of uh, see things through our own eyes. Um, but we have to remember that there was a world before Jesus. And for us to to kind of understand the perspective of the Hebrew Scriptures versus uh, Christianity. Uh, that's a little Jewish person. They looked at life and they were expecting a Messiah, someone to save them, someone sent by God, an anointed one, and they also thought when that would happen, whoop, that it would all be one event. Um, if you watch a car chase in movies, many times they'll film it this way and you see a car weaving in and out. And from this perspective, it looks like, oh my gosh, they almost hit that car in front of them. They almost hit the car to the side, whatever. But by filming it this way, you don't see how much space is in between. They're not really taking risks, etc. So that was kind of the Jewish perspective. We as Christians have a different perspective. We see God sending the Messiah one time, but we also see Jesus returning again, the day of the Lord. So once again, that perspective. And oftentimes, we end up uh, looking at the Hebrew Scriptures, and we look at it, again, from our perspective. And we can't, we can't avoid that. I mean, as we look back in history for us, we will always look back through the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, Jesus returning to his rightful place in heaven. Uh, this is the empty tomb. Uh, the resurrection and the crucifixion of Jesus. We can't look at history any other way. But what we try to do, what we try to do, is to try to look past this somewhat, as much as we can, to try to understand the Hebrew Scriptures the way Jews understand them. And there is a big difference. Um, okay, you're not going to do that, are you? Um, When we talk about uh, that perspective, if you go to Genesis and God is creating, God gets to the point of creating human beings. The Bible says, God says, let us make a human in our image. And right away we go, oh, our, plural. Well, it must mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hebrews didn't understand it that way. Jews didn't understand it that way. The R is really God addressing 
what is understood to be the heavenly counsel. Let us make a human being that has some characteristics, a way of relating like we relate. Another thing, story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, for a long, long time, Christians look at that story and there's parts in it that are very disturbing to us. And we've kind of labeled it as uh, an example of homosexuality. And, and we hold it up and we say, ah, here's a story. Uh, they were practicing uh, their relationships in this way. That's why God destroyed them. That's not the way the Jews have understood it. The Jews look at it and say, what's the story that came before? The story that came before was that Abraham is entertaining three heavenly visitors. And there's this complex, lengthy description of hospitality. How does Abraham and Sarah, how do they take care of these three visitors? And of course, culturally, within the Middle East, even today, the responsibilities that a person has towards somebody who visits in their home um, are demanding. And so the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, according to uh, the Jews, is really, well, these two, visit, two of the three visitors go on to Sodom and Gomorrah. They come. Men are at the gate of the city. They're talking. They're visiting, etc. They see these two visitors come in. Nobody offers them hospitality except Abraham's nephew, Lot. He says, come to my home at night. And of course, people in the city, they're strangers. We know how people oftentimes treat strangers. And what the people of the city want to do is they want to harm them physically. And they want to have power over them because they are strangers. And yet Lot and his family go to great lengths to try to protect these visitors. Jews don't see it as a story about homosexuality. They say, these people are so messed up, they don't understand the basics of life, of taking care of other people. What they want to do to the strangers is a symptom of that. So different interpretations. Uh, there was a Bible study that existed for years ago, and I think it's still out. Uh, Bethel Bible series, when you started, they would give you this little pin, and it would say, think Hebrew. And that sounds strange to us, but <laughs> they think much differently. And they wrote the scriptures that way. Um, so to be aware of that hopefully allows us to uh, explore the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, in ways in which we actually learn a lot more. And it really becomes kind of interesting and exciting because we kind of go, I really didn't understand it that way for a long time. Um, an example of this would be, and this is a little dated for you guys, the Korean War after World War II, the Korean War existed. On television, there was a show called MASH, on for many years, I think 11 years or something like that. It lasted much longer than the actual Korean War. But MASH, as a TV show, even though the setting was the Korean War, it was really about the issues this country was facing with the Vietnam War. They were just taking those issues and putting it within the context of the Korean War and trying to address them that way. So again, to understand how things were originally written, what was happening, and it's more than just the words in the Bible. Uh, these things didn't come down in a vacuum. There were things going on politically between nations. There was things going on sociologically. Uh, within the country itself, uh, again, the Middle East has always been uh, the trade routes between three continents go through there. 
So there's this mix of culture and languages and ways of doing things that always existed. And those things show up in the Bible. It takes a little work to discover them or understand them, but again, that's part of the discovery process. Uh, when I say that there's a variety of literature, uh, we talked about the fact that uh, last week, uh, we're, we're kind of dealing a lot with the history of Israel. Uh, but there are other stories, like the story of Job, which biblical scholars think is probably a very, very, very old story in terms of its content and what it's dealing with and how it's written and the circumstances involved. Uh, we have writings, we have the Psalms, which are basically songs. Uh, they're the lyrics. We don't have the music anymore. Uh, we have wisdom literature, Proverbs, uh, all those types of things. We know, as we talked about the first week, Genesis 1 through 11, were probably written much later in Israel's history. Uh, even the time of the exile or post-exile. Why do we say that? Because it's bringing in concepts that Israel would have learned from Babylon. They didn't have those understandings or concepts before. Even the Tower of Babel, we think archaeologically, we know where that is, what they were referring to. Uh, in Babylon, it was, had a particular name. Uh, it was a ziggurat. We would almost call it a pyramid. Um, so those types of things. Uh, so things are written later. That's not unusual. Uh, history, when you write it, usually takes time. You don't write history as you're going through it. You write history a number of years later, maybe even decades or a century later, because you're trying to understand it. You're interpreting it. Um, you're putting certain values on things. And that's what Israel does. And we know that because Israel knows the outcome of certain things. That's why we know it was written later. Uh, influenced by power struggles. Uh, we'll talk tonight about the first kings of Israel. And we have uh, Saul. And he's followed by David. Uh, there was a power struggle going on. Uh, David basically came out on top. And you've probably heard that it's the winners who write history. David has his people write history. And they write it in a particular way. They, they kind of don't speak very positively about Saul. Um, but it's interesting. Now again, they owe their job to the king. So basically you do what the king says. If you don't, you're out of a job. But we see in here where these writers, these historians, where they slip things in at times that give us an idea, kind of an, an honest appraisal of David. And even though David is revered and held up, David is probably one of the most despicable characters in the entire Bible. He's absolutely ruthless. He gets rid of all of his competition. And they kind of let us know that. You know, this person gets assassinated, that person gets assassinated, and they kind of, they mention it almost leading us to ask, well, who would have ordered that? And the conclusion is, well, the king ordered it. So we have that as far as the historians are concerned. Um, When we talk about a um, perspective, I read this in a book called the, the History of Israel by a man named Gerhard von Rod. Faith. 
faith in the Old Testament sense does not mean thinking something about God, but expecting something from God. Faith in the Old Testament is expecting something from God. It's not just a list of God's attributes. Well, this is what, you know, well, what do you think about God? Well, I think God has gray hair. And I think God must be very, very big. And I think God has a very deep voice. And I think God sits on a throne. It's not those types of things. It's that they believe God is going to act and act in their behalf. And they wait for it. They expect it to happen. It does not believe in the presence of God, but in the coming of God. And certainly when we look at Israel, they're expecting God to act. They're expecting God to send a Savior. And they live for that. Um, interestingly, because in the New Testament, here's the description of faith in Hebrews. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Future tense. The conviction of things not seen. Saying, I don't understand it all, but I trust God, and I believe God is going to act. And there may be things beyond me, but once again, I put myself in God's hands. And we have this relationship that I rely upon, and that's the way I live. That's the way I live. Questions, comments? We talked about Genesis 1 through 11, foundational stories, uh, creation, how things came into being, explanation of life, uh, sin and its origins or the origins of people, how these things happened. We talked about promises last week that it, uh, God goes to Abraham, promises him three things, land, descendants, and that through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Those three promises show up in the Bible time and time and time and time again. So it's important to remember those. And as we read stories, we can literally look at them and go, well, what's this dealing with? Well, this is dealing with them possessing the land or losing the land and getting the land back. Uh, what's this? Well, uh, they're not able to have a son. How are they going to have descendants if they don't have a son? And things get threatened all the time. And then eventually, blessings to all the nations of the world. We say that's true through Jesus. We talked about Moses and the Exodus. Big event in Israel's history. Out of that came uh, traditions. The Exodus tradition brought out, delivered, uh, the institution of the Passover meal, which Jews still celebrate every year to this day. Uh, the wilderness, God sustained them. They didn't have what it takes. They couldn't survive on their own. God provided for them. And they always looked for God to provide for them. And then Sinai, the covenant. Covenant means, it is actually like a contract. It's a relationship. God establishes a relationship with Israel. And I said last week, uh, before God even gives the Ten Commandments, he simply says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. God is taking the initiative. God is saying, well, I'm not going to wait for you to see how you behave. And it's, you know, it's not conditional love. Well, if you do this, you don't do this, uh, then I'll be your God. No, God is simply saying, I will be your God. And then how do you live out that relationship? Um, when we talk about the Bible, sometimes... I'm not, you know, I don't expect you to remember a lot of dates or anything like that. There's only a few dates you really need to remember. And sometimes we talk about it like a suspension bridge. One of those dates, again, might be the Exodus. And as near as we can tell, that was probably around 1290 B.C., Another date that might help us focus a little bit 
would probably be uh, the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 721 BC. And if you have these two pillars, then you say, okay, what came before? What came after? What came between? And then what comes after this date? And it orients us a little bit. Uh, because the Bible is not written in a chronological order. They don't just start at the beginning, go through. They bounce all over the place. And so when you're reading things and you pick up clues, you can kind of say, okay, I kind of know where that is. I handed out a Bible timeline. It's a very simple way of trying to understand where you are in the Bible. What you're reading, what's it being dealt with. I suggest fold it up, put it with your Bible. Then when you read things, if you need to, pull it out and look at it and just kind of get a feel for things. Um, last week we kind of ended with um, going into the promised land. Uh, well, actually Moses taking them out of Egypt. And uh, this week, we're going to kind of pick up from there. Uh, Moses does not get to go in the promised land. He led him out of Egypt, uh, but he doesn't get to go in. Uh, that means that there is a leadership change. Next person to take over is a man named Joshua. It's a critical time because Israel looks and says, well, we're used to Moses. Now we got this new guy. What's he like? Is he going to be as good as Moses? Does he have the same qualities? Is he approachable? Can we talk to him? Is God with, Moses, with Joshua? We knew he was with Moses. But is God with Joshua? And they have to settle all of these questions in their mind. But he leads them into the promised land. Okay, that is the Nile River in Egypt. I know you knew that. We have the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, traditionally, this is where Mount Sinai is. So the Hebrews would have left Egypt, and traditionally they have them going down here, then eventually coming up. More modern perspective is they, they may have taken a more direct, direct route. There's a, a major trade route through here. They didn't take the shortcut and go this way because there were Egypt, Egyptian outposts here. So they would have been caught militarily between these outposts and Pharaoh's army leaving. Not a good scene. Here we have the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. Jerusalem is right in here somewhere. When Israel came out of Egypt, they didn't take, again, that direct route. They came this way, and they came in that way. Now, Canaan, Palestine, wasn't empty. There were different kinds of people living there. There were the Canaanites. They were different, very different. Uh, there was a mixture of people because you had surrounding nations. You had some people who maybe lived up here, decided they wanted to move down here. You know, got their realtor, looked for a house, um, bought a house, wanted to check out the school systems, all those types of things. Israel is different. Israel believes in one God. These other people, they believe in many gods. Israel has an identity uh, which was formed at Mount Sinai. When they came out of Egypt, they were just kind of a, a loose group of people. They had been slaves, not capable of doing too much at all. 
not knowing which direction to go. Having never been out of Egypt, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, their great-great-grandparents, way back for 400 and some years, they had all been slaves. Limited ability to deal with life. They come in, and they have all these other people. There would be an immediate clash. Their language is different. They worship different. They do all of these things different. They dress different. All these types of things. But as they live there, they start to compromise. And they start to assimilate. Always happens. As people immigrate from one place to another, what's the thing that people always complain about? Well, if they're going to live here, they should speak our language. If they're going to live here, they need to do things the way we do them. And so people lose some of sense of their distinctiveness, their culture, and they start to adopt different things. Israel did that. They will later do it to such a degree that it will just virtually almost destroy them. They will change so much, they will give up so much that they will lose their uniqueness. When they come in, they've got to divide up the land. Remember, there's 12 tribes. So this tribe gets this area, then this tribe gets this area over here, and you get this little piece here, and this, well, I'll take that area there, and this, they divide it up. That's not unusual. The beginning of our country, first of all, when people came over from Europe, they settled in the New World. Uh, we don't think about this very much. You know, they establish villages, but then they have to go beyond that. More people come over because so many people were dying. There was a Native American population there. So they had a lot of the same issues going on. Uh, but even when they established a village, one of the big things was, well, who's going to get that piece of land? And who's going to get that piece of land? And anytime you deal with land, people want to fight over it. Well, he got a better piece of land than I did. I don't like that. And back and forth. He has a stream running through his land. I don't have a stream running through my land. His land's flat. Mine's hilly. I can farm there. I can't farm there. And back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's what they do. So they have this loose group of tribes. They don't necessarily get along. And it gets so bad that finally they say that they want a king. They want a king just like the other nations of the world. There's a man named Samuel called by God, servant of God, understood as being a prophet slash priest. He had characteristics. He had roles of both. God speaks through Samuel. Samuel goes to God and says, they want a king. Now, the tough part about this and the unusual part about this and the sad part about this, Israel always understood God as being king. In fact, there's parts in the Hebrew scriptures when they even refer to an earthly king, such as David, etc., and they will call that person a prince to maintain that understanding and the superiority of God. So they want a king. It's not going to work well. In 1 Samuel chapter 8. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots. 
to be his horsemen and to re run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers, the people who are closest to him, almost like his, uh, uh, what would we call it today? Presidential advisors or the cabinet. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no. But we are determined to have a king over us so that we may also be like the other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and set a king over them. Uh, we'll learn a little bit later, a few minutes, how that all kind of falls apart. Um, they get a king. First one is Saul. And it's still kind of the technical name for it. You don't have to remember this, just kind of a, an image. It's called a tribal confederacy. They all have their areas, but they're just kind of all on their own. They're all doing their own thing. Um, again, not unusual. We look at the origins of our country. You have the 13 colonies. As we started to expand west, you started to develop different states. But we know that there were great regional differences. It led to a civil war. Historically, Historically, the United States is not described as being a union until after the Civil War. There's a different perspective, uh, even though there continues to be regional differences, but the understanding of who we were as a nation changed after the Civil War. It continues to be this way Saul starts to go his own way. Uh, actually, the way it's described in the Bible, uh, we would probably say that Saul's starting to lose it. Uh, some people would classify him as going insane. He does crazy stuff. Falls out of favor with God. God chooses David. The uniqueness about David is that David centralizes everything. Um, I'll go back just a second. When we talk about the loose tribal confederacy, uh, read Judges. Oh, what is it? Judges 5, chapter 5. Uh, after Joshua... There are the judges. These are not judicial leaders, they're military leaders. And every time there's a threat to Israel, such as the Philistines, the people who come from the sea, they came from the Mediterranean, and they settle along the coast initially. Why along the coast? Because they had chariots. If they went further inland, it was hilly. They couldn't use their chariots. Chariots were a big advantage. Uh... The judges, every time there was a crisis, God would raise up a, a, a Gideon, uh, a Deborah, a female judge. And Judges 5 is Deborah's going around all the tribes saying, uh, hey, we got a problem here. Uh, are you going to help out? And some tribes go, sure, you can count on us. We'll be there. 
And then you got other tribes. Nah, we got something. We got something we got to do. We're, we no, we can't show up. <laughs> you get this from the tribes. You see no unity at all. So that's the judges. David centralizes everything. He centralizes uh, the government in Jerusalem. He centralizes worship in Jerusalem, and he centralizes. The military. Um, Jerusalem becomes the place. And that's where he rules from. David is the golden age of Israel. Uh, as Israel would go on, they would look back to the time of David and say, oh my gosh, if we could only return there. When they start talking about a Messiah, they start talking about a new David. Um, during David, there, you know, I talked about the traditions. There are some new traditions that show up. Uh, one is David, a Messiah. The other is Jerusalem. And the last thing is the temple. As Israel held on to the Exodus, the wilderness, the Mount Sinai experience, now they start to hold on to these traditions. And they become very important as to how Israel understands themselves and understands themselves in relationship with God. David dies. Solomon follows him. Solomon is his son. You know, we hear the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, Solomon's kind of an interesting character. Uh, gosh, I, I have no idea how many wives he had and how many concubines he had. Uh, he had a big he had a big palace with a lot of women. Uh, that's not unusual in the sense that uh, marriages were understood much differently. It wasn't for love. It was for alliances. If you've got a nation sitting over here and this king is in competition with Israel, Israel goes, well, let's see. If the king would just marry his daughter, you know, maybe he'll let some of the steam out of this guy. He won't be so anxious to attack us because his daughter's in the palace. He wouldn't want his daughter to get hurt. Uh, not unusual. At one point in Europe's history, virtually every king and queen were related. They were all coming from the same family. And the purpose was, once again, relationships hopefully decrease conflict. Um... These three are important, and that is called the United Monarchy. Uh, after these three, it divides. We have the Northern Kingdom, approximately 10 tribes. Not approximately, it was 10 tribes. Uh, Northern Kingdom, sometimes you will read it is called Ephraim. And then you have the southern kingdom. Two tribes. Judah and Benjamin. If you want to know where the name Jew comes from, it's because it was the tribe of Judah. So they became known as Jews. Uh, they become known as Manasseh. Where do these names come from? Uh, Ephraim and Manasseh were Moses, wait a minute, Joseph's children. When they came out of Egypt, he had two sons. And so these areas, regions became known 
under the names of Joseph's sons. They will turn away from God big time. They will just do their thing. They, they worship idols. They don't care about justice. They don't care about people. All these types of things. And finally, the Assyrians will destroy them in 721 B.C. They will never exist again. The southern kingdom follows the same path. They last a few hundred years longer. They turn away from God. They get destroyed. by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Now what happens is the Babylonians, and the Assyrians were considered probably one of the most ruthless armies in the history of the world. They made hurting people in art form. They were absolutely horrid. The Babylonians had a policy. They would take the people from here that they conquered and they would send them to another part of the kingdom, the leadership. And they would take the leadership from another place they conquered and they would bring them in here. Why? Cuts down on the possibility of revolt. Common people won't revolt if they don't have a leader. So that's the way they dealt with it. So the Jews were in exile for 70 years. A lot of questions arose then. Uh, Israel thought, well, God gave us the promised land. So our God, our land, that's where God is. You go to the border, uh, we're not so sure God is beyond the borders of Israel. Because God promised to be with us. So they go into exile and they have to find out that God is still with them. The temple gets destroyed. Everything just gets torn down. 70 years they come back and it's the restoration. They start to rebuild. Now during this time of turning away from God, we have the prophets. Huge section of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, this page here, again, not in chronological order. As you see on the left, kind of that's the order where these prophets in the Bible come. But if you look on the right, you see that it's all mixed up. And of course, the dates kind of when they, and, and to what kingdom? Some were prophets to the northern kingdom, some to the southern kingdom, um, Prophets become very important. And the prophetic literature, prophecy is not foretelling the future necessarily. That's a very small part of the prophets. They talk about God's next act. But the prophets part of the thing is to call the people back to God. To repent. Turn from what you're doing. Because down that path is destruction. Turn to God and live. Follow God's way. Mortal, what does, the, what does God require of you? But to love kindness, do justice, and walk humbly with your God. Uh, tremendous things in the prophets. Uh, we, we see somebody like Jeremiah who, who just pours out his life and also they, they, they many times reflect the emotions of God. Um, when I was in the seminary, we were supposed to you know, read portions of the Bible. Then we were supposed to have a journal and take notes, et cetera, go to class. The professor would uh, deal with our questions. And, and one night we're reading in Hosea, Hosea 11. And it talks about God taking Israel and and, and taking Israel by the hand and leading Israel through life. What an image. 
And in fact, when you know, classmates, we would talk about it, we, we had never read that. We never encountered that in Sunday school or anything else. And so we're confronted by this and everybody's going, my gosh, I was just overwhelmed with that image. People were saying, I, I just started to cry because I never thought of God having that intimate relationship with humanity. And what was interesting for me was the fact a few years later uh, to have my first child. And I have a picture actually of Mandy and, and of course, you know, six one, Mandy was about this tall. And three buildings away from our house was a little convenience store. And you used to be able to take uh, your milk jugs back and recycle them. And I have a picture of Mandy with a little milk jug in her hand, and I'm on the other side of her, and I'm holding her hand. You know, as a parent holding a child's hand. So the prophets are just filled with those types of things that, again, tell us about who God is and how God relates to us. Um, but this, again, is a helpful guide. Read the introductions to books. It'll clue you in as to what you're going to read. Sometimes they have it broken down into almost a, um, um, an outline. Uh, sometimes you run against words. Uh, look them up. You can, you can look up anything on your phone nowadays. If you don't know something, you, you run across Nebuchadnezzar. Well, who in the world is Nebuchadnezzar? Secondly, who cares? <laughs> you know, the guy lived a long time ago. Who cares? We don't care about people who live, I mean, you know, the assassination of JFK is ancient history to most of you. That happened a long time ago. So again, but these things will help you kind of unlock some of the things as far as the Bible is concerned. Um, archaeology. You know, I said last week, um, there are things we continually find out. And, and probably one thing for me is that there are so many more things that we know archaeologically than ever get shared in worship or in Christian education classes. Uh, I kind of like it. I think it's fascinating. Uh, it's informative. Remember, this is a theology book. It's dealing with who God is. But God has acted in history. But the way in which archaeologists uh, kind of approach things is that they may look at something and say, um, well, okay, it's mentioned in the Bible, but we haven't come across that anywhere else. So we don't know if it's real or whether it was made up, you know, as far as mentioning things, etc. We just don't know because the only record we have is the Bible. That's not true anymore. There are a lot of extra biblical sources there are ancient libraries that have been found with thousands upon thousands of clay tablets that substantiate a lot of the history that's in the Bible. Uh, but also a thing like uh, in Judges, we hear about a guy, uh, we hear about a guy named Samson. Samson has long hair. One of his gifts is an, an incredible sense of power. He's a strong man. Philistines eventually capture Samson, cut his hair, loses his power, uh, put, they blind him, and they chain him between two pillars. And Samson prays to God, give me the strength one more time. And Samson pulls the chains and literally pulls the pillars and the building collapses. 
and the enemies of Israel, the Philistines, that there are a great number of them, they're killed that day. Archaeologically, we have found, we, like I was on the dig, uh, they have found uh, a building, a Philistine building with, guess what? Two pillars that would have supported the entire roof. And we look at that and we go, ah, you know, Israel's not just making stuff up. These things actually existed. David, for as popular as he is in the Bible, there is no other mention of David outside of the Bible. And we start to go, well, is he just a fictional character? Not too long ago, they find a, ta a tablet, a clay tablet, another area of Palestine, etc. What does it have on it? The house of David. And archaeologists go, ah, David existed. Other people knew about him. So those are just kind of sidelights. It, do, it doesn't prove God. I, you know, I always say, even if they found Noah's Ark on the mountains of Ararat, even if they proved that the Shroud of Turin was the burial cloth of Jesus, that's still not faith. Because even if it's the burial cloth of Jesus or Noah's Ark, we still have to believe that God loves us. We still have to believe that Jesus died to save us, that we have forgiveness. We still have to believe that God's present with us. We still have to believe in the hope of everlasting life. And those things cannot be proved by physical artifacts. We have to trust the relationship. So um, to learn about the relationship, to learn about who God is, how God has acted, uh, that's what we're trying to do. This is a brief overview, uh, maybe more extensive than, you know, again, what we might get in Christian education uh, throughout our time within the church. Um, questions? Tom. Um, something about a lot of things that we see in the past, like that we find in the future, it definitely gives us a better overview of life and the things that make, give us a better understanding of what happened back then to what happens now. And the sad part is about the example you, you included about Ark's uh, well, ship, Oh, the ark ship. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, there's a chance that we may, be able, may not be able to find any evidence about it in the future, about if it was real or not, mainly because of the fact that, well, nothing, well, not really nothing, but a lot of things on Earth don't last forever. Huh. So they all kind of have its course to go away at some point. Yeah. Uh, we're going to kind of cover some of this stuff next week when we talk about theology and science uh, and what each of them provide us in terms of our life uh, and just kind of a preview a little bit. Um, they're not meant to be in opposition. They are both revelations. They're both discovery about this incredible universe that we live in. And it is a wild ride. I mean, there is so much to know and to see that just, you just kind of go, you know, amazing. So if we open ourselves up to it, uh, again, I, I, I think there's, a, there's just a lot of excitement in that about life in general. So...